All right. Happy Wednesday. I am messing with the listener and viewer folks this this these past couple of weeks. I'm just messing with people. The days and the times are off, all this stuff. So we're back with another Learning Tech Talks. It's Wednesday in the morning, which is very different than the usual time. But hey, everybody knows the time that it usually is. But we're still exploring the landscape of learning tech, although today we're not exploring tech solutions. We're going to be talking about it's going to be a combination of things, so I'm not going to spoil it because we're going to get into it. But I'm joined by Stacia Gar, and she's the what co-founder and principal analyst. Is that your official title at Red Thread, Stacia? That is right, yes. All right, see, nailed it. We're off to a good start. We're off to a good start on this. And she's a fellow ed tech, HR tech enthusiast. In fact, what this week you were on two lists. You're, I get to actually speak with an official HR tech influencer today. So <laughs> you've been you've been on the awards list this week. Yeah, the a couple of actually three, if you can believe it. It was kind of, uh, three of them. Week. I only saw the two. Yeah. Yeah. So, so so two tech ones and one diversity and inclusion one. So okay, which is cool because okay. you know we I work at the intersection of a number of different things. So it's cool to be on multiple. There you go. Well, yeah. So there was HR executive. I saw the DEI one. What was the second HR tech one? Uh, it was a uh, uh, hum HR hum HR HR hum. I can't remember the the. Okay. But right. but you know, just another group. But seventy influencers okay. you should follow. So if, if people don't know what to do with those lists, because I remember I used to be like, what is this? And why 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 does <laughs> what I use them for is like I then like go follow those people because I figure like if someone thinks they're pretty smart, like they're gonna make me smarter. So yeah. I don't follow. So that's okay. how to use All right. them for those who don't okay. know. So that there you go. That's how to use those lists. So if you're not following Stacia already, then that's what you should do right now is go follow go follow her on LinkedIn. Uh because I mean, the, the work you guys are all doing over at Red Thread, I, I'm a big fan. I follow the stuff you put out because it is great in terms of keeping up with the industry. So let's talk a little bit, though, yeah. before we get into it, because we're going to talk about some of that stuff. You got two yep. you got two big research studies coming out. So we're going to hit on that topic. We will inevitably hit on the big topic of hybrid work as yeah. you're traveling now. Um, you know, so this kind of goes back to this, things are kind of starting to open up, but now it's clamping back down and who knows what's going to happen where, by the way, for those who are, I, I completely skipped this part for those who are watching, comment in, let me know where you are Stacia, You're, you're traveling, which we, that is the spoiler yeah. that we, we said there, where are you right now? Yeah, I am in Napa. It, you know, it's a rough place yeah. to travel to. So yeah, yeah. I'm sorry yeah. that yeah. Uh, that's that's really unfortunate. How long are you there for then? Because I saw yesterday you were at an event. You were going to be live tweeting some details. So that yes, yeah, so that's where I am. So it's uh, I'm here just till today. So it's a two day okay. event. Um, and then next week I'm in both Austin and then Atlanta, all in a four day period. So. Okay. I feel like I'm like diving back in on the deep end. <laughs> and are you going, is that you traveling around for conferences? Or are you going to events? What's all, what's on your agenda? Yeah. So these are mostly um, events and so vendor events. So right now I'm at okay. eightfold, um, the, right. the you know, talent acquisition, talent management skills platform. And then okay. next week I'm at Perceptix, Um okay. And then I'm going to work human. Um, and okay. then week after that, Danny's actually at Unleash for several days. So if anybody okay. wants to meet up with her, she's there. I should probably kill me for telling everybody, but you know. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, and then um, and then actually, you and I were talking about this in the pre-show, but then Danny and I are getting together. First time we're seeing each other, co-founders, in two and a half years. So... Oh, that's so awesome. Fantastic. That's uh, yeah. So so it's funny kind of going through the conference stuff because yeah, I mean I've I've seen all the conference stuff popping up. So so now you're signing up for you're signing Danny up. So Danny, yeah, if you watch or listen to this, all the people are gonna just bombard you at Unleash because <laughs> I know there's a lot of people going to that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's that that'll be so two and a half years because that was my question when you said the two of you were gonna get together. Um, and I'm like, oh, when was the last time you saw each other? Two and a half years. I'm like, wow. Okay. That's, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, well, no, it, it is crazy. She's, she's like had a baby since then. I mean, she could have had multiple babies. since then. <laughs> 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 you would, 
you would know. You would know. But I would know. That's true. That's true. You would know. Well, so let's talk a little bit because some folks might be. I'm familiar with with you and Danny and Red Thread, but other folks may not be. So just to kind of set the tone, because we're going to be talking about, you know, the the title is about insights and, and research and things like this. So we are going to talk about some of the stuff that's coming out of research. But for folks who may not know, how do you when you tell people I'm the co-founder of Red Thread Research, and yeah. they go, that sounds interesting. Like research into what? How do you describe how do you describe to people what you all do over there? Yeah, I'd say that we are a human capital research analyst and advisory firm. Uh, and so and then obviously, you know, we cover a range of areas. So so Danny, and for those who don't know, Jenny Johnson is my co-founder. And so she focuses specifically on the things you tend to focus on, Christopher. So learning and career and internal mobility and, and then all the technologies that support that. I'm kind of on the other side of the house, which is more around talent management, talent strategy, uh, people analytics, DEIB, employee engagement and experience, and kind of how all those things weave together. Um, so, so we do all those things. We're a research membership, so folks can buy um, access to the membership. We even have individual memberships, which is different than my alma mater. So I was at Person by Deloitte before this um, for eight years and then was at CEB, now CEB Gartner. And um, one of the things that used to drive me crazy about those places is we'd have these you know, students or people who are in a smaller business come and say, hey, I love what you're writing. I'd like to like, be able to access it. And we'd be like, well, that will be fifty thousand dollars, please. Thank you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and nobody could, could do that. And it's like you know what? The people who work with those companies deserve great research information, insight, just as much as somebody who works at GE. And so yeah. when we launched Red Thread, one of the things we did is we actually we put it. And someone's got to pay for the research. We have to. <laughs> someone has to yeah. enable us to do the work. But we put in an in individual membership so that you know someone who just wants to to improve their development and learn what's happening in the industry can actually just like someone is big company. So. Okay. Well, and I, and I've got to say, I really appreciate the fact that you do that because having worked at a lot of big companies, you do, if you work at a big company, you, you sometimes take that stuff for granted. You're like, Oh, well, we have access to this and that and whatever. And you don't think really much about it, but yeah, if you're, if you're just, you know, even in a functional group, sometimes as a functional group, you don't even know that the corporate team has access to some of this stuff. Yeah. That's the other thing. But yeah, if you try and reach out and go, all right, I'd really like to get access to some of these industry insights and things like that. Like you said, it's like, oh, I wasn't really planning for like that much, you know, of a cost associated with it. So I think the fact you've democratized that and you guys put out, you put out a ton of stuff just open to folks as well. I mean, I, I get a regular sea of information from you all on different research studies you do or, or insights into things. So, okay. Yeah. So yeah. On, go for it. Oh, I was just going to say, so yeah, one of the things that we do, for instance, we do like an infographic for every major study that we make available for free. I mean, so obviously it's not the in-depth, you know, analysis that, that we have in there, but at least it gives people something, you know, some of the key statistics and all that. And sometimes it's all folks meet, need. Um, you know, yeah. hopefully they get benefit from the other stuff um, as well and want to be members. But, you know, but yes. ultimately, like we're in this to try and make the world a better place by helping people make work a better place. And so, yeah. you know, that's, that's our ultimate goal. Well, and I, your infographics, what's funny is you bring that up because I think one of my I had a post that just blew up and it was your infographic from the LinkedIn learning research study yeah. that you did on skills for L and D professionals that that blew up. So those infographics, they're a popular, they're a popular thing. So here's a here's a follow-up question to this on the research, because I'd love your take on this, because you did such a good job explaining what do you do with influencer lists or how do you think about influencer lists? So now I'm gonna put you on the spot on this one. When it comes to research, I am curious your perspective on how people can make the most of that. Because I think sometimes when it comes to some of this research, there is, and I, and I post about this yesterday, there is so much stuff mm -hmm. coming out, hitting people from all different sides in terms of, well, there's this trend or here's the data on this. It can feel overwhelming. And, and I have no doubt that there are folks that go, I, I honestly am not really sure what to do with it, which sometimes then that leads to you take the infographic, you throw it in one of your presentations and go, and here it is. And you kind of hope it sticks. 
But how do you recommend when people, you know, deal with research that they actually make the most of it? Because I think that is an area that is an opportunity area for a lot of folks on the practitioner side. They may have access to this stuff at their fingertips, but they may not necessarily know what they're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's there's a couple points. One is um, they don't necessarily just default to what you just mentioned, which is being a consumer of research. But I think to the extent that you can be a part of the process and the learning that come. So that's actually one of the things we did with RED that is fundamentally different than any of the organizations I was at before. And I think really anybody else is that we try to bring in practitioners from the very beginning. So like we launch a new research study and we say like, this is the press, this, these are, this is what we think we're going to ask about. These are the hypotheses. I was like, what are we doing? Like, you know, you and I were talking earlier about how sometimes, you know, you see people write things and say things and you're like, well, if you had any idea what it's really like, <laughs> you yeah. would not no, even say that, right? Um, yep. And and so as researchers, we need that voice, but also then practitioners, I think, need to be involved in some of these discussions because it helps you see like, oh, other people are thinking about it this way, like even just from the problem statement, right? Like, because if you don't ask good questions, you're not going to get good answers. So I would encourage folks to first think about, it. is there ways that I can be involved in the learning process of research? Because once you get to the end, you're going to have a much better understanding of what's happening. Um, and I'm, and I recognize that everyone is busy. So I'm like, you're actually in the trenches, but, you know, having conversations with people who are at the early side, I think can be helpful. Um, but then to go directly at your question of, you know, Hey, if you, you see a research study, what, what do I do with this? Um, yeah. particularly around trends, like to be honest, sometimes the trends reports are some of my favorite to write. I know that's <laughs> Right? Yeah. We're supposed to, but it's, but there is some element of like, well, okay, so like stuff's happening, but what am I supposed to do with it? And what I would suggest people do is one, you know, you look at, you look at the trends and you say, okay, in what ways are we potentially, are we responding to this? Or is this keeping, or is this um, something that will hit us kind of flat footed? So, you know, if you think about what we were writing three, three, five years, we were writing about digitization. We were writing about how, you know, you were going to have a more um, mobile workforce, how, you know, people are going to be, we, it's actually really funny. Danny and I had, we didn't write it, but we had on the docket of things we were going to write for 2020. In 2019, um, uh, the uh, employee experience for digital nomads, like that was a report we were planning to write in uh, 2019. And then, you know, the world blew up and, and <laughs> yeah, them, right. And if people, and if people a little people, things changed. <laughs> a few things changed there. Uh, but if people had been, you know, prepared for being digital nom- nomads, right, their transition to fully remote work would have been a lot easier and, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. So, so I think the question is, are we preparing for these things? And is, is question one. And then question two is, um, and, and maybe it's the other way around, but how does this impact us as a business? Because sometimes, you know, like if you're in a heavily unionized manufacturing organization, some of the things that we write about, like realistically, they're, the timeline for that impacting you is really long and so that may just not be something that's quite as relevant um so you know so maybe actually that's the first question is this even relevant to us but then second if it is are we preparing for this are we thinking through it and then third is you know going once you've decided it is like okay what are kind of the tactical elements and the first one almost always is getting other people on board with your with your view point of view so saying hey i just read this great red thread article on blah i think it would benefit us in x y and z ways would you would you have a look and and sharing that information with your team and aligning on vision okay i so so i'll I'll add some commentary to that because i think i love the fact that we took some time that wasn't on our agenda either but i I just thought you know what (laughs) this is one of the things that i see really causing a lot of disruption for folks is they aren't really sure what to do about and i love the point that you brought up being involved in it so easy it's it's easy to kind of put things off but well i don't have time i'm too busy doing things and this is how you actually get better and more efficient is by getting involved in this stuff because you do learn from other people you hear other situations and go wait a minute you build that network of connections you i mean you solve you end up solving a lot of problems so while it seems like oh that's a lot to do on top of what i'm already doing it's like well but this is actually helping you get your work done. So participating in it versus being an armchair quarterback and going, 
well, that that's not realistic. Well, so then be part of it and help shape it and, and then bring that conversation. So I love that you brought that up. But the other one too, with the trends piece is really important because I do think, you know, I, I'm the same way. Like people, you know, I always get asked like, what's the latest trend in learn tech? And you're like, ah, I hesitate to even say it because then as soon as I do, people think that should be my priority. And that, like you said, that's not how to think about research or trends is, okay, I just kind of shift my priorities or set my priorities based on whatever the trends are. That's If that's what you're doing, you're using the research wrong. It's really, yeah. like you said, it's that litmus test of, hey, if there's a trend on this report and you're going, I've never even thought about that, that's probably a problem. You should probably yeah. go, am I familiar with this? Is this something we're thinking about as part of our strategy? Does it impact us? Like you said, is this something we go, ah, you know, our business isn't even there yet and probably won't be for a while, but don't. And I think that's where people get that change fatigue is every time they see a new industry research report come out, they think it's a constant, oh, now we got to go reprioritize because my priority list doesn't match this. And it's like, no, that's not it. It's, I think your example of yeah. the digital nomad is a great one. Like, had you been thinking about it in 2018, in 2020, you might have been like, oh, this isn't that big of a deal. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, and I think that point about not necessarily reprioritizing is, is really important um, because look, if it, your strategy should be based off of what your business is trying to do and what your business is trying to achieve. And so if you're thinking through, okay, this this is our strategy, I would say that the, the trends are almost, you know, a, a sideways or a filter over which to lay. So like, you know, you have a strategy for, for whatever, um, you know, get, <laughs> filling, filling people, sorry, my, it, it is early. Here. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I know. <laughs> Um, but, but let's say you have a certain strategy. Let's just say that. But, and then you would say, okay, you know, am I thinking about skills in the context of this strategy? Yes. Am I thinking about, um, you know, how we're going to be, uh, you know, did if we're back in 2019, you know, digitalizing um, our, our capabilities? Are we thinking about all of these things? But it doesn't necessarily say that this is the only thing that you're prioritizing. It's more like, like I said, like that filter. Um, the other thing I want to comment on, and I, I'm not trying to be like too self-promotional here, but but consider the stores, right? So so like an organization yeah, like Red, no. Red is not trying to, like we are a research organization and that is our business. Our business is not a big like, consulting thing we do do some consulting but but it's very limited it's more like honestly christopher it's more like people who we are good friends with come to us and say we want you to can do you help work. us <laughs> yeah can you help us and and as you know we often very intentionally pass it off i'm like we're like no we're not, we're not gonna do that like yep. here's three other great people and usually when we do consulting it's when they come back and say no we want you to do the consulting yeah i don't think you're hearing us i'm yeah. not asking for help in this area i'm saying i want your help <laughs> And then we're like, okay, all right, all right, we'll help you. But, but you know, but but the point being, like, we are that is not that is not our bread and butter. Our bread and butter is doing research. But organizations yeah. for whom research is effectively marketing, um, yep. you just need to be aware nope. of of the source of those materials because they are they are probably encouraging you to reprioritize so that they can get in there and help you with the new prioritized list. So just be thoughtful about your source. No, and I think uh, I would, and I think if, if this is a this is a fair point to bring up on this because if you're a practitioner and you've been a practitioner in the space, you may not be aware of all this stuff, and that's it's no fault on on anybody. It's just you may not be aware of how much of this stuff that you may be seeing is influenced by, you know, this is a sponsored or you know, it's a type of thing where it's like, well, there's an agenda behind it, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I think that's one of the other things right. is. Sometimes yeah. it gets demonized like, oh, well, this is sponsored, so ignore it. No, but then again, I think your your filter lens is a good example where you say, so just filter it through that and say, okay, knowing that the agenda that the next hot big tech platform is yada yada sponsored by said big tech platform, there's a vested interest in them saying this is the next hottest trend because it directly ties to that. Now, does that mean it's not a trend and that you shouldn't consider it? No, but no. just recognize yeah. that 
you know, do you just the Pied Piper, you know, follow that? Well, just be careful with that. And I think that's a, it's a very valid call out because a lot of people just don't understand how some of this stuff works. Yeah, for sure. And, and also I think you, you need to feel like you have some trust in the source. So like, for instance, we license sure. our, our work, right? So, so you, whatever, it, we did a report a number of years ago called um, skills versus competencies. What's the deal? Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, having a bit of irreverence is an important part of Oh, you have to. It's the only way you can make it. It's the only way. Um, but, uh, but the folks over at Workday license that. And, um, you know, and for us, nobody influences what we write. No one yep. has an influence yep. on what we do. But they, you know, they were like, okay, we think the market needs to know a bit more about this. We're going to, you know, we, we're going to distribute it to our, our prospects and other folks and, you know, and all the rest of that. So, but but the thing is, is like for, again, it comes back to, to who is doing the writing and, and the source. Like when we go into any of those conversations, I, I will say like, you will have no input over this. Are you cool with, with licensing it? Right. And, and yeah. some people are like, oh, and, and I'm like, okay, cool. Like there's plenty of other places that'll do that. So, so that's fine. Um, but you know, just you need to know who's, who's doing the work or even more so um, in, you know, I'm not speaking again to your point. There's valid work being done, but but consulting yeah. firms, you know, consulting firms put out you know all sorts of good good data, but very few will put out something that they could not also then consult on and and deliver yeah. that service to you. So it's just you know just be aware. No, and I think the awareness is just the key. Again, you're you. It, it's just like I mean buying buying a vehicle. Like it's best to be an informed buyer so that when you see the things, you can put it through that filter and go, okay, is it still valid? Like I can still take insights from it and go, okay, but I also recognize there's there may be an agenda behind it that I just need to filter and temper things down with that. There's a question that came up that I am going to ask, but I think the the example that I'll kind of flesh out that going back to how this conversation started with on the trends piece is a good example of one that I saw recently that created all this kind of debate as it grew was immersive tech, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it was popping on the list. Now you've seen, you know, this is the next hottest thing in L and D is, is immersive tech type of a thing. And, and I've seen people and I've, and I've been in conversations where people have asked, you know, so should we reprioritize things to focus on immersive? And again, that's an example where I say, um, I mean, no, not um, maybe my answer is maybe because I'm like, what are you trying to do right now? You know, mm -hmm. are you, are you doing some heavy simulation skill development where practical applications a problem? If it is, and you're saying, mm -hmm. have we considered using a different kind of technology to try this? It may be a good opportunity to say, well, I, I we haven't considered it. Maybe now's the time to try it. If you're saying we're not doing any of those things, then you might say, okay, no, it's not. And maybe we should be thinking about as we get there, do we know enough about this technology? Do we know how it might work? Are we familiar with players in the space who are doing it? Yeah, but don't shift your priorities. And, and what I see sometimes is people then end up arguing over, mm -hmm. well, immersive tech isn't the next hottest trend. Oh, I think it is. And you're like, that's not the point. That's the so point funny. is the tech is reaching a state of maturity where it can go mainstream. Are you considering that as a factor? And there isn't a right or wrong answer in terms of yes or no. It's, well, what are you prioritizing right now? And then figure out maybe there's a need to pivot. Maybe there's not. Yeah. And I, I think the another example of, of that has been, you know, everyone's been AI, AI, machine learning, mm. you know, all, all the rest of that. And, and, you know, I think that there is incredible potential with, with AI and machine learning, but again, it's something you need to know and you need to understand what the use case is and, and how it might be important or not important. So, you know, yep. in, in all honesty, for everyone who says that they're, they're doing AI or machine learning, I'd say there's maybe 10% who are actually doing it. Like if you pull back, you know, the hood and look like legit, there, if you legitimately like, dug into what their algorithms are. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. actual AI. It's actual AI. And, but the thing is, is to be honest, it's not necessarily a problem per se, because no, if the solution does not require, if, if the problem you're trying to solve does not require AI or ML, and these folks are saying, well, nobody's going to look at our solution. We say it's AI or ML, and it's basically a marketing exercise. 
I mean, I, I don't know that any harm is being done there, but the no. thing is, is that as a practitioner, as a buyer, you need to understand, okay, these folks are, you know, this is the problem they're trying to solve and, and hopefully that I also need solved. And in these instances, this more sophisticated uh, capability is necessary, but it's okay if, you know, for in situations where it's not necessarily like, okay, these guys said that to get, get people in the door, got it. All right, check, move on. Let's actually understand what it does. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I've talked to a lot of, of marketing heads at, at the different tech companies and they're in a tough spot. They, they can be in a tough spot because you have to fit an industry category. You know, RFPs just have all these things that if you say no to one, it's like, well, then you're off the consideration list. And it's like, well, but it's not even relevant to what we're trying to solve for, but we have to be able to say. So they're in a really tough space. And I think that's where, as I, over the years, I've gotten to know the tech companies better. I have a lot more empathy for some of the challenges that they have to deal with to say, look, we, we've got to kind of do some of these things. Mm -hmm. Again, I think of back when Degree broke into the LXP category before that was a thing trying to explain what an LXP was when it wasn't a category. I mean, I remember Kelly and I just talking about how challenging it was to even get people to go, a what? That's not, that's not a nice category we can fit into our procurement process because yeah, yeah, we don't have a they don't get it. Right. We don't have budget for an LXP, whatever that is. We only have, and that's, there's a lot that goes into that. So I think, you know, this goes back to, and, and, I think as practitioners, there's some responsibility, not some, there's a lot of responsibility, which is where I think this conversation is really helpful because it is about, you have to, if you hear in the trends that AI and machine learning are becoming a big thing or immersive learning is becoming a big thing and you go, I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. That really is on you to say, I need to take the time and, and energy to figure out enough about it to be dangerous so that I can evaluate strategically <laughs> whether this is important or not important. Doesn't mean I have to shift my priorities. Doesn't mean I need to move everything around, but it does mean I shouldn't be unable to have a business conversation about it intelligently. And if I don't, I just need to take the time to figure out how do I get to that point? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's a great point. And you know, the, the, there's always going to be something new, right? It's just like in, in the new newspaper, right? <laughs> you don't sell newspapers by not having some new thing that you would be worried about. Like, it's just, that's the nature of the beast. And so, you know, I think that some of what this is, is, you know, like you said, looking at it and saying, okay, is this relevant to me? And then, you know, the other component is just looking and saying, you know, am I hearing this enough for me to think this is actually real? Like, yeah. you know, it, and that is where there's benefit in looking at a lot of different sources, um, yep. because, you know, if five or six or seven of them are all saying whatever matters, um, then I think, you know, that's, that's probably an indication that it actually is a thing. Right. That, that said, there are in, you know, I would say that research organizations are a little bit better, not, not just Red Thread, but, but others as well, at identifying some of the edge cases coming sooner. So if like, you know, yep. I think that different practitioners have different level of comfort on where they sit in terms of like, you know, my organization is just kind of standard middle of the road. We want to be aware of what's coming, but we're not going to be on the cutting edge. And other people are like, we are like on the bleeding edge of what is coming and yeah. happening. And so, you know, if, if your organization is more on that, you know, looking at some of those different trends and, and particularly from organizations that don't necessarily have something to sell, but maybe starting to see something or to sense something sooner. Um, that's where those can be useful as well. So a lot of times, like we'll write about things a year or two before they kind of hit the the yep. mainstream, if you will. Um, and you know, if you're on the cutting edge, that that can be extremely helpful um, in seeing yeah. around corners. Well, and I think everything we're getting back to just goes back to being this, being informed and understanding what you're dealing with and knowing how to work yeah. with this stuff. Because again. I, I deal with a lot of practitioners who read the trend reports and they feel like we're so far behind. We're so far behind. And what you're, what we're talking about here is no, you're not actually. I mean, it's, that's designed to give you that, that North star, that future cast of, yeah. okay. So in a couple years, maybe we should be kind of working towards that. Although it can be a, you know, I think, and I think that's one of the things that I was thinking as you were talking about this, one of the cautions that I do sometimes see on the practitioner side is you can dismiss these trends. That's the other side. You do see the folks that kind of, I think Kelly, you brought it up in the comments, shiny object syndrome. 
there's that where you can go, oh, this is the thing. Let's reprioritize everything to this stuff that our organization is five years from even being mature enough to consider. But you can be on the other side of that where you just dismiss all this stuff and go, yeah, we're not. We don't need to worry about that. We're, you know, we're over here. We're comfortable doing that. And I would say to folks on that end, this research can help you go, well, you know, if everybody's talking about this and others are doing it and you're going, not us, you may want to reevaluate where you're at. And I think this gets back, tying back to what you said early in the conversation, participating in this research and collaborating with people can be a really helpful way to figure out where you are on that spectrum. You know, if you're in that peer group, that research group that you're hosting on the next thing, and nine of the people in there are saying, yeah, we're starting to explore this, we're doing it here and there, and you're going, we haven't even talked about this. It may be time to say, well, you may need to start having that conversation. Yeah, and I think the other thing too is it's very easy to be dismissive of things that at first blush look really hard. And- Yet there can there can often be simpler fixes than what other people are doing. Um, there are ways to inch up on it, in you know either through small process change or through um, pilots in, in a small part of the organization that is interested in this type of work. So, like an example for me is um, performance management. I know I you know mentioned that we've had a study coming out on that, but you know I've been writing about performance management since for a long time. More than a decade. <laughs> <laughs> For a while. <laughs> For a while. And, um, you know, when, when we first started talking about, you know, moving away from a rigid once a year approach. I, you know, I remember this trend. It was like everybody was on the kill the performance review t- train bandwagon. Everyone was. And, and, you know, and that wasn't at the time, like I was like, well, you could, but that's a little bit skeptical of, <laughs> you know, it, it certainly wasn't the solution for every organization. Let's just say that, yeah. right? Um, but, <laughs> Very political way to put it. <laughs> um, but, there, but we did need to change performance management, we did. right? And so, so like you didn't have to be on the kill the performance review side of things to be like, okay, well, is it completely crazy that we're only making sure our managers are talking to employees once a year? Yes. Like just full, like as a human being, that's a terrible idea. So yep. what might we do that is a small step in moving, you know, towards, towards not doing that. And, you know, it just is an incremental process. It could be okay. You know, send an expectation that you have a quarterly check-in where you talk about performance. Like that is a big process change, but that can make a big impact in the organization. And so, you know, yeah. You don't have to kill the performance review to make performance management better than it was, for sure. Well, and I have a follow-up question on this, but I think, and this is where, as practitioners, taking time to reflect on what's being said underneath what's being said is yeah. really helpful. Because I remember when that trend was going big, and it was like, we need down with the performance review, we're stripping them. I was in organizations and and helping some organizations in a similar, and they're like, we got to get rid of it. How do we get rid of the performance review? And I remember being like, how are you going to evaluate anyone's performance if you have zero data points anywhere? And when you really dug into the problem, it was, well, people aren't talking to their managers other than once a year. And it was like, okay, so that's the problem. The problem is, managers are kind of ignoring conversations till this year end thing. And I think that's the point you're bringing up is, well, you don't have to kill the performance review to address that, but you can say, all right, what are some steps we can do to encourage more frequent check-ins between a leader and their direct reports, which, I mean, this is organizational change. I mean, this is significant stuff. So I am curious with this, you know, without spoiling the whole research report, because this is a topic that's very close to mind right now for me. Um, I've been in a lot of discussions on it because this is a getting back to the behavior. What would we really like to see as an organization in terms of this? And when, when do we formalize that into a performance review? And when do we say, we're not going to formalize it? What's happening with performance management? And then, um, I, Brian, I will come back to your question because I you know what? Let's let's table this for one second because I, I will forget Brian's question if I don't. The other question, going back to research, and then we're going to go mm. to this performance management, 
is do you have any suggestions before we kind of shift off of kind of the how to use research, things like that on how how do you recommend people evaluate research? We really talked about the value of kind of having that breadth of different research, understanding there's some underpinnings behind it. But if you aren't as familiar with the inner workings of some of that, are there any things that you've seen that you can kind of recommend to folks to kind of say, hey, here's not a watch out as in now throw this research out, but hey, this is kind of an indicator that you may want to consider carefully or consider it through this lens if you're doing that. So you know, is this unbiased? Is there a bias bend to it? Things like that. Yeah. So I would start with making sure you look at the methodology. And if there is no methodology, that's a red flag. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> then, then calling it research is actually kind of, yeah, a stretch of the word. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's actually somewhat um, terrifying how many people don't share any information on what they do. And like, yeah. there, there's different levels, right? Because I could geek out on this stuff for a very long time. And yet I recognize that most people do not care. <laughs> but you should be in the group that at least somewhat minimally cares, meaning that you yeah. should go find the methodology. You should understand, for instance, if it's a survey piece of the survey work, who was surveyed? Over what time frame were they surveyed? Um, a general sense, if possible, of what the what the breakdown was of the population, like is it actually representative, and what was the size of the the sample? So you know, just as a very like rough number for y'all, um, if you're trying to say that something is representative within the United States, that the minimum end should be 370. That's just like a statistical um, uh, break point. Um, so so 370 that is, what people uh, organizations like. You, so, so organizations. Okay, yeah. okay. So it should be 170 organizations. Often, what happens with samples is that it is roughly they're roughly equivalent. Like for instance, in our data sets, we rarely have multiple people from the same organization taking um, a survey. Not okay. that we don't ever, but but it, but but it's a good point. You know, what what is the number of organizations? Um, okay. So that that would be the thing I'd be looking for. And then look at the questions or even if you if you don't have the, the actual questions listed, if you see the data, think to yourself, OK, what's the question they had to ask to get to this? Because, you know, if if the question is, um, you know, which immersive technology do you like best? Right. Like, the <laughs> And, you know, there's these options. And, and then it's like, you know, and then they're like, you know, whatever. 70% of people love, you know, this type of immersive technology. And it's like, well, there wasn't even like a question before that, which is like, do you think immersive technology is good or important or, you know, but okay. like, you know, so, so language gets twisted to serve somebody's point in an argument, which is the paper. And so, so sometimes saying, okay, is this what this, these data actually are saying, or are they maybe just changing the way that they're presenting this information? Um, so read it, read it critically would be my suggestion. Well, that's though, those I think are really, and again, you see this where you'll see latest industry report. And, and again, you don't have to be a complete analyst geek to, no. to care about some of this stuff, but I've seen it where you go, well, I mean, what even like how many people were included and you'll scroll down and like at the very bottom in the fine print, it's like 20 people surveyed in you know this. And you're like, ah, that's not necessarily representative of a very broad spectrum of people to be saying, this is a trend type of a thing. So I think that kind of digging into it. And I love the kind of reverse engineering, which is kind of what we were talking about with the performance management thing, where it's like, yeah. What problem were we really trying to get to that these responses or these results came out of this? Because if it, if you know it wasn't really clear, like you said, you were leading the horse, which I, <laughs> we we don't need to go down this path because then we'll get too far. But I mean, even question design and all of this, which yeah. we see in culture assessments and things like this, if your culture scorecard is only asking like, how much do you love working at this company? A lot, a ton. <laughs> to, you know, like, exactly. wow, everybody loves working here. Well, you technically only ask them how much they love working here. So what choice did they even have? Or even, you know, the, the framing of it made it pretty clear that you don't want to be the person that says, I, I don't, 
I don't love working here type I, yeah, of a this thing. Is, <laughs> this, this isn't really my favorite place. Oh, that wasn't one of the options. Oh, <laughs> that wasn't one of the options. Okay, well, I guess I'll pick not applicable and then my data is not included in that. So I think those are those are <laughs> some good considerations for folks as you're looking at that. And, you know, we, we, without getting into the details of it, I mean, the last two years has exposed how vulnerable people are to taking kind of the headlines without doing the due diligence that, that you said to say, Hey, like, let's actually dig a little bit deeper into where is this research coming from or what is actually this being based on and, and how is this headline being created? Is it being created from uh, things like that? So I think it's a, a really good call out for that. Okay. So let's shift back to this performance management. And if you think of anything else on that one, but I think those are two really good tips that anybody looking at a research report, that's, that's a simple action you can take. Look at, look at the methodology without getting, you don't have to even get too geeky on it. And then actually look at the questions and say what questions were asked or what questions might've been asked to try and get these responses type of a thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on this performance good. management one, I am curious because this does have impact. Some people might go, well, what does that have to do with learning? What has a lot to do with learning yeah. when you think about this is how leaders are engaging with their people, which ties to leadership development, which ties to organizational. I mean, this ties to a lot of different things. Where are things shifting right now, you know, with people's and I think this ties to the hybrid work thing as well, because you think about all of a sudden managers were left with a distributed workforce. They weren't really sure how to connect with their people. This ties to a lot of stuff. So what is coming out of that in terms of where orgs are at today? Yeah, so there, there, this is a study that we did um, where we actually have longitudinal data, which is super exciting because we, okay. um, we did a study, we did a survey in, what was it, say October of 2019. So right, you know, generally pretty close to before the pandemic. We then surveyed in October of 2020, and then we surveyed in October of 2021. So okay. we we're able to- Oh yeah, like right now. through the thick of it. <laughs> yeah, right through the thick of it, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so something we're seeing is one, a shift in the purpose around performance management. So when we asked okay. in 2019, why do you do performance management? It was like, well, you know, to evaluate employees. Like that was the top reason. Um, and then what has actually happened over the course of the pandemic is instead people are saying their top reason is to measure product is to enable, not measure, enable productivity and to enable engagement. So a fundamental kind of shift in the way that people are looking at the intention of it um, is, is one thing. A second thing that we saw was that organizations are increasingly um, uh, getting better at communicating around goals and the importance okay. of goals and keeping them up to date. And one thing that was a really interesting, it may seem like a small shift, but I don't think it is, was um, in 2019 when we asked about goals, goals were like a manager thing. So it was, hey, yeah. Christopher, like you go set some goals with your employees and like, you know, you guys yeah. go do your thing and awesome, that's great. And like the organization said you should do it, but like, eh, if you didn't do it, whatever, right? I mean, not, not totally whatever, but it wasn't really. Like no, but yeah, a little more of a haphazard kind of siloed. We, we're not too concerned about it. Make sure that you do your thing. So we have something to manage performance against. Exactly, exactly. Whereas now what we've seen, particularly to your point around the workforce was so distributed, it was like, if you don't know what the goals are, you probably don't actually know what your people are working on. And so it shifted to much more of an organizational thing. Like organizations are much more embedded in the in the goal setting process, much more uh, in on top of it and making sure that those things are happening and making sure those goal related conversations are happening. Um, so it shifted from kind of an individual thing to a system thing, if you will, um, which okay. I think is actually a great development. It's like what we've been trying to get people to do for years. So, so that okay. was um, a good thing. Um, and then the other thing in the, and this is actually going to be coming out in the report will be published a few, uh, in a few weeks is when we looked at kind of what makes post management work before we talked about, um, uh, culture capability of managers and then clarity as kind of these three different concepts. Okay. Um, now in this new study, clarity, which was around goals, actually got rolled into culture. So it's more of an organizational mm. thing. And then the third, and we do still have a third C, but that third C is connection. And so the okay. idea that 
part of performance management in these conversations really is to connect people to the organization, which makes sense when you okay. think about, you know, the distributed nature of what we've been doing. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like you need to feel that connection. And within connection, there's an element of, or uh, actually I think this some capability managers, but there's an element of care um, that wasn't there in the data before. So, so we're okay. shifting more from this, this, we're here to evaluate performance and that's what we do to instead we're trying to engage, we're trying to help you be more protective and we're trying to make sure that you feel connected to the organization. So what's really interesting about this, and this is where um, I personally, like, I think it's easy to get caught in your functional silo. So, you know, oh, I'm mm -hmm. a learning leader. So I look at learning trends and learning tech trends. And, and I actually spend just as much, if not more time, looking at the broader talent and organizational trends that are happening. Because even just as you're talking through this, this has direct implications to really, if you're trying to be a forward-thinking learning organization, everything you just said actually should be impacting what you're doing from a learning standpoint. Because this is actually a fundamental shift in the way organizations are thinking about their people, which is they need to be connected to a bigger picture. They need to have greater clarity and they need to feel more connected to one another, which when you think about what learning and development and talent development is designed to do, it's those three things. And historically, we've either struggled to do that well or we've tried and the organization really didn't have the appetite. It was like, ah, yeah, you know, whatever. That's that's fine and dandy, but we have work to get done. And I think this is where we're seeing organizations fundamentally shift the way they're prioritizing and thinking about things. And I and I've seen orgs, L and D orgs go. They've kind of gotten this beaten out of them, where they're like, yeah. ah, "We've tried this, and nobody would listen." And and I'm actually seeing a resurgence of the companies now asking for this. And I'm seeing sometimes L and D people go, "You know what? We're not no." we're not, we're not there. We've tried this before. It doesn't work. And it's like, no, the actual organization is shifting its whole thing on, on the relationships and learning's tied to this. If, if you've got an L and D initiative that is not tied to the bigger, and I think this is where the skills discussion is coming in. Mm -hmm. Why am I developing these skills? We keep telling people you need to reskill and upskill and this and that. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> why? Like, I don't care. Like you, this feels exhausting to me. And it's because a lot of times we're not connecting this back to, because fundamentally organizationally we're going here and this is the change in our business that's going here. And as a result, you are going to be here and doing that requires you to be all of this threads together very, very, very well. So it's interesting hearing, you know, this is how fundamentally organizations are changing the way they think about their workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they are. And I think that this reflects also a, um, a shift in, in how we expect to get, you know, to, to just engage with people and the experience yeah. that they're having at work. You know, I think, you know, you look at how many people are, you know, becoming contractors or going into the gig economy, and you look at the gap in, in the talent that we have, and we look at the great resignation, and it's like, you know, we we as organizations have to, in some, to some extent, go from being the hammer. If you think about traditional performance management, it was a hammer. Yeah. You either met the standard or you didn't, and like you didn't, you know, out you go. But in right, it was, I mean, it was it was the Jack Welsh way of doing things Jack for a Welsh, long exactly. time. He and, said and, it. Yeah, and but but like yeah, can't because a lot of people like. I actually here's kind of a, an anecdote, but I think it illustrates the point well. Um, I have a friend who is in house counsel at a. Uh, company that actually just recently IPO and uh, she was doing great work. Like she, she was fully responsible for getting this IPO off the ground from a legal perspective, et cetera. And she goes into her performance review and her, and her manager actually gave her like the one below meets expectations. And she was like, what? Like I am like driving this thing. She's like, well, you didn't like do these two things like that, you know? And, and she, <laughs> and she was like, I have, it happens. Yeah, you know, it happens, right? And two days later, she's like, I'm out. And then they were like, oh, well, will you come back and consult? Like, oh, no, no, actually, you're really valuable, you know? And it's like, no, actually, I've got better options. I got, and she like went out and she started her own consulting thing, like helping these types of companies, IPO, and, and she's doing fabulously. And, but, but that yeah. is the reality, right? Think of how that conversation could have been different around like, 
back to your point around needs and development and care and connection, like you're doing this stuff really well. Here's some areas we'd like to see you. And this may have been a situation where having no score performance for you could could have been, could have been a good thing. Could have been. Well, but, but even if it had gone back to more conversations and informal things where, Hey, these two things, you're not delivering on them. So at least there's awareness of like, Oh, I didn't know, or here's why I'm not because I'm prioritizing these like, Oh, okay. Never mind. You wouldn't have got into that conversation and gone, doesn't meet expectations. Like, are you out of your mind type of a thing? Because that's hard to come back from. Right, right. And like in this situation, there was no coming back. But exactly, because she's like, I'm prioritizing the IPO and the things that go in front of the board. So no, I did not do these two minor things. Like, <laughs> but it, you know, when yeah. when it feels like the pit, you know, the hammer's out or the pitchforks out for you as an employee. And that's what you get in performance management. That's not going to, you know, you, people aren't going to stay they, and, and they have. No, they options. won't. So, well, you know, and, and you, and the, so that's why you have to think about it differently, right? You can't you just be thinking about it as it's evaluation. And that's what we're seeing in the data. So if your organization yeah. is just thinking about it that way, you know, you need to be reflecting on what that's actually going to do for folks. Well, and I think there, there's two things that came out of that, you know, this little kind of snippet is, is this one, the shift to organizations are starting to recognize, and Kelly, you brought up a good point that she moved over into talent management and organizations are recognizing that employees, this connection across the entire employee piece is so critical. You can't yeah. treat them one way here and then differently here and differently here. It's like, this is all interconnected. The way we recruit people has to tie to the way we develop people. And the way we develop people has to tie to the way we do performance and the way we do organizational planning. And I mean, everything is so interconnected because at the end of the day, they're all people. And they're this, I use, I keep using the word thread, which is ironic given I'm with (laughs) red thread, but there is a thread that connects all this stuff together. And I think organizations are waking up to that going, oh, we've kind of just been treating this as a tactical list of like, well, there's a fire over here. Let's put out that fire. There's a fire. And it's like, well, that fire started because of this fire, which is tied to this fire. And you're literally just running around putting this out. And I think the other thing that um, that came to mind as you were thinking, as, as you were talking about this is, you know, this is an area that we have a lot of opportunity to influence right now. Like we really can um, with some of the things that are happening in our organizations as we think about the conversations we're having, as we're thinking about, you know, we, we've talked in learning about wanting a seat at the table. I hate that phrase. But realistically, organizations are saying, hey, we, we, you could have one. It's, it's here now. Um, and this stuff isn't, I am curious your take on this because we will run out of time. We aren't even chipping the surface. But <laughs> Some of this stuff isn't new. And I one of the things that came mm-hmm. to mind as we were talking about this, I remember when the gig economy talk, this was way before the pandemic. People were talking about the gig economy picking up and all of this, which was this leading indicator that people were starting to wake up to this. I don't really like working in a place where I feel like I'm not really appreciated. I don't really understand what I'm... They were kind of starting to wake up to this I don't really want to do this anymore, but there wasn't necessarily the kerosene on the fire that pushed it just boom. And then the pandemic hit and all this stuff that people just went, you know what? Forget this. I mean, Mm -hmm. I, I've been killing myself for whatever. I've had zero flexibility. I've, you know, not been appreciated. Now I'm proving that I can do all this. I'm not going to put up with this. And I think had some organizations been paying attention to some of these trends early on saying, why is the gig economy really starting to gain steam? Why are more people willing to take risk? Well, it's because they're realizing that the risk of being at a full-time job isn't really more safe than consult. They're realizing that, you know, all these things that they could have maybe got in front of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and and this goes back to our earlier conversation about just thinking through what's at the root of whatever the question is or the yeah. challenges or the trend is that you're seeing, you know, understanding, okay, like, 
the, these things are, are happening. So, you know, to your point on, you know, if you were to apply that to right now, you know, the, and we think about return to office and, you know, the desire for flexibility, like what is, what is underneath that? You know, um, I, I think there's a lot of things underneath that, that, but, but as an example, you know, people, people realize they weren't seeing their kids. They, people realize they, you know, now they've right. had two years with, with their kids <laughs> and they're like, oh, wait. Maybe right. Actually I actually kind of like being around my spouse and my children. I, I kind of forgot about that. Or the, like the number of people who are like, oh, like I actually am now exercising regularly because I'm not commuting or, you know, whatever it is. But, you know, think about why, what is driving this thing and what is driving this thing in your organization? And if you don't know the answer to that, there's all sorts of awesome employee listening technologies out there. <laughs> and that's another report yeah. that we have coming out. Um, that can help you understand that. But whatever the big trend is, ask, why is that happening? And why might that be happening in my organization? Yeah. Well, and, and what's funny about this is with the pandemic, I remember when it first hit and everybody suddenly got thrown you know, remote. Mm -hmm. I remember going, you just wait. Two years from now, everybody's going to be freaking out about return to office because the employees are going to go, well, wait a minute now. I don't know that I really, it was like, you could almost just see three years in advance of, oh, this is going to, and I see now, you know, organizations to some degree, maybe focusing on the wrong problem because now they're like, well, yeah. do we go back to the office or do we go remote? And it's like, you're asking the wrong question. You're not listening to why is it people are struggling? Because the reality is you talk to some people and they realized they didn't really have social connections outside of work. And so right. then this loneliness trend is blowing up and you're like, yeah. okay, but do we solve loneliness by forcing everybody into a conference room? Like, I don't know that that's necessarily the right. Yeah. And I think this gets really, really complicated, really, really fast, but there are some ways where you can look at those leading indicators to go, okay, rather than waiting till the fire blows up and we have to try and solve for it, look at those ahead of time, which I think this is yeah. what we've been talking about with the research. It can be extremely helpful in doing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you're absolutely right that people are asking the wrong question when it comes to return yeah. to office. Um, we are doing a podcast series right now on hybrid. Um, and we have some, we, we, we let off with um, John Boudreau, who just published yep. a book on uh, uh, work without jobs. And, you know, in, and then we did, um, we've dropped one with uh, Don Klinghoffer of Microsoft, who's done a ton of work in this space. We've got RJ Milner from Uber, who will drop next week. And then actually, uh, Michael Arena, who was with AWS until two weeks ago, <laughs> when he decided to pull the, uh, pull the gig worker cord and, and jump out. Um, but, but I would say the headline from all of these these conversations we've been having is it's not about the policy of two or three days in the office. It's about no, what is no. the work that needs to get done and where do you, where can that work happen best and by whom? And that is a fundamentally different way of thinking about what needs to happen. Um, but if we're able to do that, we're both going to have, you know, the benefits of, of remote work and the experience that we had just now with the opportunity for connection and, you know, whiteboarding and, coming up with ideas together. But if you, yeah. to your point, if you force everyone to get into a conference room and you're like, okay, like, why are we here? So that we can be friends? Like, <laughs> I like friends. I have a lot of them. I, and I know, I have friends. a lot of them. You know, I don't like, necessarily, yeah. <laughs> is that really why we're going to a conference room? Like, no, that doesn't I, make much sense. Well, and I think, and again, we'll, we'll wrap this, but I mean, I just even <laughs> think of this skills conversation because one of the things I think that's coming with this is as people start to better recognize what their skills are and what their value is, suddenly the doing the job that is only 10% of the skills that they really bring to the table, suddenly they're like, I don't know that this really works for me, which is what we're seeing with the great resignation where they're going, I would rather use that 10%. 80%. And I don't know if I can do that here. I mean, this is, there's a lot of this stuff that's going to come crashing down around us that we have opportunity, I think, for organizations to build up things to be prepared for it. So again, I, anybody who's following, not following Red Thread, I would really encourage it because this is an opportunity to get in front, in front of some of these things, find people to have these conversations with, 
because they really can be helpful in being more predictive in where we need to go. Cause you can, when you start getting into it, I don't know about you, but I feel like you can start to read the tea leaves oh, yeah. a little bit better where you go, Oh, I see what's on the horizon and this is coming for us if we're not ready for it. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and that's what you get from, you know, just making sure you stay on top of what's happening in the industry. Thank All you. right. Yes. Well, Stacia, it has been a pleasure as I knew it would be. Thanks for making the time. Thanks everybody for listening. Hopefully this just gave you some different insights on how to think about research, how to get in front of some of these trends and what some of these trends are and what they may mean for the work we do, because there is a lot to unpack here. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Thursday and a great week. Safe travels to you, Stacia, in the rest of your weekend. Well, actually over the coming weeks, say hi to Danny for Thank me you. when you get together in person. I will. I will. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for listening today.